Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Peter Bregman, who is in New York City today. How are you doing, Peter? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Excellent. And for over 30 years, Peter's worked with CEOs and senior leaders to help them create accountability and inspire collective action. And he has a proprietary process that is intriguingly called the Big Arrow process. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, um, Peter, why don't you give me the kind of the, the origins or the genesis, the foundations of the Big Arrow process? Sure. You know, actually, it's an interesting story uh, because it came out of a failure that that we faced, which is we were coaching uh, someone senior in an organization, the head of Europe of an organization. I was working, uh, I'm a coach and I was working with the CEO and I had people who worked for me who were coaching for uh, with the head of Europe and a few other people. And, and about two months, three months into the coaching assignment, I said to the CEO, how's it going with this guy, right? Who's the head of Europe? And he said, well, from a coaching perspective, it's going great, but we're going to have to fire him. <laughs> and I thought, you know, uh, I can't <laughs> explain. Like, those two things don't make sense in the same sentence. He said, well, you know, what we said was he wasn't taking initiative and he wasn't kind of moving forward ambitiously and he wasn't, uh, you know, pursuing a vision with clarity. He's doing all of those things. All of those things we said he wasn't doing, he's doing. It's just that he's doing them in completely the opposite direction that the rest of the company's going in. And and it made me realize that when you bring coaching into organizations, because it's confidential, because it's focused on the individual, it's almost always distinct from and separated and detached from what's happening in the organization. Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of work as a consultant in my life, and I've done a lot of work as a coach in my life. And I would say that consulting almost always leaves people behind. It almost always prioritizes the spreadsheet over people. Mm -hmm. Coaching always prioritizes the people over the organization. And so to meld the two together, to say you've got people working in an organization. How do you coach them to be successful and in alignment with each other so that they are moving forward individually and collectively they're moving the organization's most important work forward? And it's one of the challenges that I'm seeing in organizations right now, which is that I see a lot of productive people, right? A lot of people Mm -hmm, who are getting stuff done, but the organization itself is not moving forward the way (laughs) to. And that's because you've got arrows moving in all sorts of directions, right? You've got arrows and you've got people who are moving. They're, everyone's individually productive, but not necessarily collectively uh, moving forward in the same direction. And so you've got cross purposes and you've got some people who are working on one thing and other people who are working on the exact opposite or who are pushing back on those people. And so everything stalls out. Yeah. And so the big arrow was mostly focused on trying to address that issue. Yeah, because it can get obviously intensely frustrating in an organization when you, I mean, because you can call out silo thinking and all of that. But if people are, you know, as you say, being very productive and, and doing what they're supposed to do, but they don't have a bigger context in which to do it, you're going to get these kind of cross currents and conflicts. Yeah, and it's and it's you're right, and it's twofold. It's having the larger context, and then sustaining the collaborative interweb of mm-hmm. activity, so that we're all moving towards that context in the same way. Because I think one of the mistakes you make is you say, okay, let's just create a vision statement, or let's right. create a mission statement. What are the values we're going to live by? Great. Now everybody go achieve your goals, and you know within a month people are moving in all sorts of different places. So, you know, within a few days, they're moving in all sorts of places. Mm -hmm. So I think we need a consistent process that gives some structure to individual success moving collectively in the same direction and that and in an ongoing way, because it's very easy to move on tangents and get distracted. (laughs) Absolutely. And it's and particularly in a world that we live in today, where distractions are everywhere. But how do you how do you achieve that? Right? Because even with people with the best of intentions, suddenly over time, they'll forget to communicate, they'll forget to collaborate. And it's not that they're that they don't want to, it's just that they're everyday work gets in the way. So how do you keep that process of collaboration and communication going? Um, so it's a great question. And it's what the big arrow process really covers. And, and it's, um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'm going to talk about my latest book here for a second, mm-hmm. because it's very connected, which is it's called leading with emotional courage. 
And it talks about four elements of leadership, which is confident in yourself, connected to others, committed to a purpose, and then emotional courage. And emotional courage is the willingness to feel what you need to feel in order to do the hard stuff. Right. So to give you an example, if think of a hard conversation that you have not had, right? A hard conversation you know you should have, but you haven't had. Maybe it's with a customer, maybe it's with a prospect. Maybe. And now think about why you haven't had it. And I'm willing to bet you know exactly what you want to say. You have the skill to say it. You've had time and you've had opportunity. So why haven't you followed through? And it's because there's something you don't want to feel. If you have this hard conversation, you might feel their anger or defensiveness or or their sort of the ambiguity of their not knowing what to say or passive aggressiveness or mm-hmm. your own anger, your own defensiveness if they come back at you, which they might do. And so you might have to feel all of those things. And so as a result, you don't do it. And if you're willing to feel everything, if you're willing to feel the anger and the embarrassment and the passive aggressiveness and the shame and the you're willing to feel everything, then you can do anything. Right. right? But that's so that's emotion that's the emotional courage piece. And if you think about confidence in self, it's I'm clear about what it is that I'm about. Connected to others is I'm not gonna lose that, but I'm still gonna actually connect with you and and hold sacred what's important to you while also holding sacred what's important to mm-hmm. me. And committed to purpose is the overarching piece, which says we're all moving towards this thing that's outside of us and bigger than both of us. And then emotional courage allows you to do all of that. So the way we translate that into organizational work is we go into an organization and the first thing we do is we help them to identify the big arrow. What is mm-hmm. this most important right. outcome? This is the commitment to purpose piece. What's the most important thing that we can do to achieve uh, the outcome that will drive us forward, right? What is most important for us to collectively focus on? That's the big arrow. And it directionally sets and creates the boundaries for all the other arrows, which is everyone's individual activity. Mm -hmm. The next thing we do is we ask the question, who are the key contributors to making that happen? Who are the key people who can drive this big thing forward? Then what we do is we assign every single one of them a coach. Now, it's, we have this, sca- this process of coaching that's scaled and that's it's, you know, relatively inexpensive compared right. to the coaching mostly is done. And, and it's also like what we don't do is go into an organization and say, who are the problems and let's coach them, <laughs> right? Because that's not a good use of your resources. Absolutely. The right use of your resources is to identify the key people moving your key outcome forward and then invest in their ability to drive forward most effectively. Once we're started to coach them, we look at what is the key contribution they can make to driving this forward? What is their greatest strength and their greatest weakness? We do some feedback loops that might get in the way of their making their key contribution. Then we pull everybody together and we all get on the same page about what it is that we're driving forward. And we do that at least once a month. And meanwhile, in between, everybody's being coached to drive their key contribution, to mitigate their negative uh, issues or weaknesses, Mm -hmm. to leverage their strengths, to drive the big arrow forward. So we've got this big picture, but we're constantly nudging and moving and supporting and growing and developing and helping everybody move individually and collectively in the way that's going to make everybody successful. Yeah, and I think that's a that's an interesting point you raised there because I think that's the that's the key is like, you know, people generally you know, have, they want to do the right thing. They want to move this forward. It all makes sense to them, but it's the consistency piece that is hard. The biggest thing. Yeah, because people just don't, it doesn't come naturally to people to be consistent, especially nowadays, it comes more naturally for people to either get sidetracked into one thing or just get distracted by many things. Right, right. That's exactly right. I mean, the hardest thing in all of this is follow through. I was just literally you know, on the phone just before this conversation that we're having with someone who was talking to me about a problem she felt like she had with motivation. And my answer was, you don't actually have a motivation problem. You're driven to do this thing. You care about it. You're having this Mm -hmm. conversation. It's not a motivation problem. It's a follow through problem. And follow through is very different skill than motivation. Mm -hmm. You know, motivation is about rah-rah and excitement in the moment. Follow through is about the tactical, habitual, actions that we take over time in order to drive in a certain direction. And that's very different than being motivated. You can have people who are tremendously motivated who are terrible at follow through. (laughs) And collectively as an organization, we can't afford that. Yeah. And let's face it, I mean, follow through, you know, it can be pretty boring and it can be pretty, you know, you can can feel it routine. and And I think that's why probably a lot of people shy away from it. But just coming back to that piece you talked about, the emotional piece earlier, 
It's kind of interesting because I don't think most of us are taught how to be uncomfortable, uh, you know, how to face uncomfortable situations. And especially nowadays, you know, everything is around almost removing any discomfort, um, artificially removing any discomfort. So, you know, how do you help people, and it sounds like an oxymoron, but become comfortable with discomfort? No, I, I think it's a great question. It's why I wrote Leading with Emotional Courage, right? Because I want to answer that question. And we we run a leadership intensive. So we run this leadership program that we know does it, right? We know mm. we've we've done the research to say that if you do these things, you can develop your emotional courage. And by the way, if you develop your emotional courage, you will become a better leader, be more willing to raise difficult issues, be more capable of receiving feedback and criticism without shrinking or getting defensive. Like all these, all these markers of effective leadership and effective communication, you're going to do them better if you develop your emotional courage. So you're asking the right question. How do you develop it? And this is the tricky part. You develop it by using it. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you want to be used to taking risks, if you want to get good at taking risks, you have to take risks. If you have to be willing to feel things, you have to be willing to feel them. So then the question is, you know, well, great. How do, <laughs> how do you get there? And the answer is small steps. Here's a little trick. If you could put yourself in situations, and this is why I run it as a training program, mm-hmm. is because training, by definition, we create this environment in the training program. The environment you have to do is you have to create a gap between your perceived risk and your actual risk, Mm. right? That's how you learn. So if I were to uh, stand in front of you and a bunch of other people and whoever's watching this and go, (laughs) right? Like to me, I I might, like a lot of people might not want to do that, right? Because (laughs) you look stupid and it's silly and right? So the perceived risk is high. I Mm -hmm. might be embarrassed. People are going to make fun of me. Think about doing that in a room. But the actual risk is zero. So if you could create situations where the perceived risk that you might feel something is really, really high, but the actual risk is really, really low, you want to use those situations very liberally to take risks to feel things you might feel. Yeah. And and that's how you develop it. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a that's a that's a great piece of advice. Because as I said, I don't think this comes naturally to most people, and I think we're we're living in an ever more artificially sanitized world where we cut out anything that looks like it could possibly put us make us uncomfortable or stop us being liked by everybody. For sure, right? No, for <laughs> sure. And I think we resist it. And when we resist it, we we reduce our ability to act in the world, right? Mm-hmm. If I don't want to be embarrassed, there are many fewer things I would be willing to do than if I'm willing to be embarrassed. But yeah. right? if I'm willing to be embarrassed, I could take some risks. If I'm willing to be disliked, if I'm willing to feel what it's like to be in conflict with you, mm-hmm. if I'm willing to fail, right? If I'm willing to try something and fail then I have this incredible wealth of opportunity to act where I might possibly succeed. And, you know, we're talking about sales. Mm-hmm. You know, think sim- simply think about like a sales call. Like if you're not going on sales calls with, with a high percentage of possibility of failing, you'll never succeed. Sure. So y- you, you have to be willing to feel failure if you're going to take any possible risk that can bring you, you know, success worth having. And then coming back to the the big arrow process, because obviously this is key when you have all of these people and you're trying to get them to move in the right direction together, then to achieve that, they naturally are going to have to have at times difficult conversations with each other to keep everybody on track. Impossible not to. You know, mm-hmm. it's actually really very, very hard to live without. So if, if you are someone who lives by avoiding all hard conversations, <laughs> you probably spend a lot of your time um, muting yourself or repressing things you want to say or you want to mm-hmm. feel or living much smaller than you need to. And and I, I uh, you know, I've had this conversation with a few people recently and it's really kind of been on my mind because I really am committed to people living big. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I think we minimize our size to make people feel comfortable, and it's a mistake. 
And and if you really live big, it means you're going to expose yourself. You're going to sure. be vulnerable. You're going to say things that people might not like. You're going to take risks that might create a backlash. And you have to be willing to stand in that. Mm-hmm. And, and compassionately, by the way, with care. I mean, if you say something that offends someone, then you know you have to be willing to listen when they say, I'm offended. Right. And to hold it and learn from it. And say, wow, that was not my intention, but I recognize that impact is often different than intention, and mm-hmm. that's how it impacted you. But I'm learning something about the words I can use or what I can say or what I can't in order to have the kind of impact I want. So thank you for, for letting me know. And, and, and then you help them be big because then you've given them a positive experience of giving you some feedback where they had their voice heard and it was respected. And then everybody rises and everybody's big together. And that's really, I mean, you know, how long are we on this planet? Exactly. Like, let's play big. <laughs> and just going back to the other point you said, I mean, I really like that idea about, you know, the, the idea of the perceived risk versus the real risk. Because, I mean, I think, you know, obviously a lot of people are risk averse, so they perceive the risks as way bigger than they are. But if you look back over maybe the things that you've done where you've been successful, you can probably find those moments where, oh, I thought this was going to happen, but actually it didn't. And, right. if you, and oh, you can build on those. Of time when you misperceive the actual risk, mm-hmm. like misperceiving the actual risk, which is why we limit our action, right? Because we, cause, cause I think walking into a room and starting to dance is actually a risk when in fact, not so much, right? Yeah. You know, like some people are going to forget it the next day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do think we overrate. We tend to um, right. over overstate and overrate or whatever, or, or how many people are actually paying that much attention to us, right? Right. <laughs> right. So, right. so uh, as we bump up against the end of our time, what are, what are some other things that maybe you want to explain just a little bit about the Big Arrow process, or just some advice for people in general how to how to live big? Yeah, sure. I could I could do a little bit of both. I mean, part of our process when we're coaching everybody, and it's this is unusual in in coaching, is we collect data because we're coaching at scale. So mm-hmm. we're coaching a number of people. So we can we could really respect everybody's confidentiality and still get some very useful data about what's working in the organization, what's not. So instead of coaching a whole bunch of individuals, you figure out, I'm coaching a bunch of individuals, I'm helping them to succeed individually, but I'm also seeing trends about the kinds of things that are getting in their way. And those trends are really important to understand. So if you're, you know, if you're embarking on coaching in an organization, really be thoughtful about the kind of information that you're collecting, uh, if you can collect it, because, you know, like when we do it, we can collect it because we keep confidentiality and, you know, we have very strong agreements and our coaches understand it and they don't share things. But you, you can figure out, oh, you know, there's this thing that's getting in the way of everybody in the organization, and let's figure out how to break that down mm-hmm. in, order to, in order to succeed. And, so, and that's really helpful. And in terms of playing big, you know, I would say it will always feel like a risk. Mm-hmm. It will always feel, and here's the thing, confidence in self, right, in leading with emotional courage, these four elements, confidence in self and connection to others are in, interplay with each other. So that we all know people who make themselves small in order to make other people happy, right? They give themselves up in order to please people, mm-hmm. which means that I'm I'm so desperate to connect with you that I'm willing to disappear myself. And that's playing really, really small. And then there's another way, which is to say, I'm so desperate to feel like I exist in this world and I'm important that I'm willing to step all over you in <laughs> order to be seen and heard, right? We all know those people also. <laughs> And that's also, both of those are desperation, and both of them are playing small. You play small when you have to be seen and heard, right? And you play small when you're not willing to be seen and heard. Mm -hmm. So it's really balancing both of those, which is I really respect myself. I really respect you. I'm not willing to give up either of us. Right. Right? And I'm willing to stand in possibly the discomfort of our disagreement, in order to keep that space of respect so you can be big and I can be big too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just- yeah. And I love that because that's a, and it's also kind of the concept of abundance rather than looking at the world in, in as a zero sum game. It's like, um, you know, if I respect you and maybe I pump you up a little bit, then it's at my expense. But, uh, right. but reality, you know, there's enough space for all of us to be big, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Listen, thanks, Peter. Um, before we go, if you just want to tell people a little bit more about yourself, your organization, how they can learn more about you. 
Sure. So my name is Peter Bregman. Uh, you could find out lots about us going to bregmanpartners.com, B-R-E-G-M-A-N-P-A-R-T-N-E-R-S.com. There's lots of resources on the site, books and, and articles and videos and things like that. And um, I'm a master certified coach and I'm the CEO of Bregman Partners and I lead a team of 25 coaches and we really focus on helping senior leaders and teams create positive behavioral change and to work more effectively together to get their organization's most important work done. Yeah, and just to say, I'm, I'm a big believer in coaching. Um, I've had it myself in the past. When I first uh, had my first executive level position, the first thing I did was hire a coach. And I just think, as one message to people out there, we don't invest enough in ourselves, um, you know, and we need to do more of it because sometimes we invest more in, in coaching for our hobbies outside of work than we do for the yeah. things that put bread on our table. <laughs> I, I beautifully said. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Okay, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline is CRM. Again, thanks to Peter Bregman in New York. Uh, I'll see you all again for another expert interview really soon.